Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of The Rock Experience with Mike Brunn. On this episode, I'm joined by bassist Greg Chasen, and he'll talk all about his time working with Badlands, as well as auditioning for Ozzy Osbourne, his brief time with Rat, and so much more. I think you guys are going to really love hearing the stories about Eric Singer, Jakey e. Lee, and more. So let's jump in and let's get started. So first of all, I want to thank you for joining me, Greg, on the show today. You know, it's really exciting to have you on. Um, you know, we got a great career, Badlands. You did a lot of other things. We'll cover all of those things today. But, you know, what I would like to do is kind of start at the beginning. And what age did you start getting into music and playing bass? Uh, I didn't start playing bass till uh, the summer that I got out of high school. Oh, wow. So I was kind of like a jock, <laughs> uh, athlete sort of thing. I was supposed to go to college to play baseball. And I really wasn't interested in going to college. I liked playing baseball, but I had trouble getting through school. So I didn't see where college was going to be any easier. <laughs> so um, some guys approached me and said, hey, if you buy a bass, you can be in our band. And they were younger than me. And I thought, well, I don't have anything better to do at the moment. And uh, I was getting ready to go off into my working career. And so I bought a cheap bass at a pawn shop and went to, uh, they had an amp, went and rehearsed with them. And within a couple hours, I said, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to be a bass player. So that kind of came out of nowhere. So it wasn't something that I ever planned to do. I didn't have any particular musical ability, acumen whatsoever. I was just a guy that liked listening to the radio and liked certain things. And one day, Later, I'm a musician, so. That's amazing. Now, as you're saying this, I'm looking behind you and I see all of these picture frames. They look, some of them look like a home plate from baseball. Are those you? These are my son and my daughter. That's uh, awesome. This is called the wall of baseball softball. Uh -huh. <laughs> and my son played, uh, he played all the way through college, played four years of college nice. ball. And my daughter played through high school and could have gone on and played in college, but um, she didn't want to have to deal with the uh, amount of work that has to go in. She watched what her brother did in college. You have mm -hmm. to practice year round, sure. you know, and she just didn't think that that was something she wanted to do. So she actually played badminton as well in, uh, in high school. And she was actually the state badminton player of the year, her oh, senior wow. year. Congratulations. She, <laughs> that she coaches at the high school she went to and they've won a number of state championships. So She's uh, finishing her last year of college and she also coaches badminton there. And my son is a teacher and he coaches baseball at the high school and I'm his assistant. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now you said also you were around 17 coming out of high school when you first started playing bass. What music were you listening to at that time? Um, the same kind of music I listen to now. <laughs> Isn't it always that way, right? <laughs> I mean, I really liked Humble Pie. Humble Pie is my favorite band. Uh, Rock in the Film War was out around that time, and so that was a big deal. Um, who the Who? Who's next? Um, and Live at Leeds, uh, Grand Funk, uh, anything before they got commercial, mm -hmm. I listened to, especially like E Pluribus Funk, Cactus, Big Cactus Freak, and uh, uh, Wishbone Ash Mountain, nice. uh, Early ZZ Top, mm -hmm. um, obscure stuff like Stray Dog. Uh, Lucifer's Friend, um, Three Man Army, and even like, uh, of course, Deep Purple and Zeppelin, The Sabbath. I, I you know, I, I run the gamut of that. And even bands like uh, Trapeze. I was really into the early Trapeze stuff with Glenn Hughes. So, yeah. All, all the essential 70s stuff. 
all the stuff that uh, <laughs> basically shows up in the music I write now. So <laughs> without a doubt. Right. So when did you first join? I'll say your first professional band, right? You said you had a couple of guys ask you to, to join a band and you bought a bass, right? So, but when was your first professional band? Well, later on, um, a few years, what happened is the guitar player that talked me into playing bass, I only played for about eight months and then he moved away. Okay. And moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And under the, and he was always, it was always going to be like, when I'm going to move back in about a year and a half and we'll, or two years and we'll, keep playing your bass and we'll start a band up again. And I was like, Oh yeah, sure. So he moved away and you know, there was no internet then. So he would write me a letter or call me and say, so you're still playing your bass? I mean, Oh yeah, sure. I didn't even <laughs> talk. I took it out of my closet one time just so I could move it to get to my gun. <laughs> get to my shotgun. I was like, Oh yeah, I forgot I had this. Mm -hmm. Then out of the blue, like almost two years later, he, he called me and said, Hey, I'm moving back like in a month. And, I lied to him and told him I had a whole band, oh. you know, and I had this whole BS story going. <laughs> and so all of a sudden I had to like find a band and I was at a, a, a football game with some friends of mine. And um, I was complaining about, man, I, I need to find a band. My buddy's moving back and I've been BSing him about this band. And so someone said, well, Jim over there plays the drums. So I said, you play drums? He goes, yeah. He goes, Okay, you're in a band. He goes, okay. <laughs> and then another guy said, well, my parents will buy me a PA and, and I think I can sing. Okay, you're our singer. And so when he got back, we started a band and that band actually played, um, you know, kegger parties or um, uh, we played at a couple high school dances. We were nice. horrible because we didn't play anything that anyone could dance to. You know, it's hard, <laughs> to, dance. hard to dance to Highway Star. Right. You know, there's no one's dancing to Sabbath, bloody Sabbath. So, you know, that really was, I mean, we really like to play obscure. We, we didn't play what was on the radio. Right. And so um, that band, which was called uh, Ghost Rose, um, that was the first band that actually started playing out. And we, we did some gigs as far as that, but later on it just morphed into, uh, it was me and that guitar player and then Jeff Martin, uh, the Badlands drummer, sure. the second Badlands drummer, he eventually joined. We changed our name to St. Michael and then we started playing the bar circuit in Arizona and playing it, in Arizona. It's real big to play keggers out in the desert or it was back then. So you, they'd build a stage in the side of a hill, get a generator, uh, <laughs> basically fence off the road, charge five bu bucks a carload to get in. And there'd be like 50 kegs mm -hmm. featuring, you know, featuring bands like, uh, you know, Ghost Rose and Zoot Cooter and <laughs> whoever else. And then you'd come in and see these bands and people would get drunk. And you could get two to three to 5,000 people show up at these events. Oh, wow. Nice. It would be huge. It would be huge. We had no P, you know, we had a little tiny PA and right. I'd be screaming my head off. By then I was the singer. Okay. And we would just uh, kind of pretend we were going to be rock stars someday. Well, and for you, it happens, right? So, <laughs> so Jeff and I did manage to take it a little bit yes. farther. So, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when does Surgical Steel come into play with all of that? Uh, uh, in the late 70s. Okay. Uh, me and uh, a guitar player, Jim Keeler, and his drummer named Pat Dixon who eventually ended up playing, he played in Icon, uh, a band from Arizona that I'm sure you're familiar with Icon to mm -hmm. make some records. Yep, I've heard of it. And um, so we tried to start a band called Surgical Steel and it didn't work out. So um, the guitar player asked if he could, later on, could he keep the name? He was gonna join this other band. He wanted to change the name of that band to Surgical Steel. And I said, yeah, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, um, they didn't really write and they wanted to play original stuff. And it was at the beginning of the new wave of British heavy metal era. And I wrote. So uh, they asked me to be in the band. And so I eventually ended up joining their version of Surgical Steel. But um, probably a year and a half after I originally had the concept of it, of doing like this heavy metal thing. It was pretty popular. Right. Um, obviously, if anyone has heard any of the stuff about Rob Halford coming on stage and singing with us that kind of ramped things up pretty quickly. Yeah. And then you were also on the Metal Massacre album as well, right? I think the second one. We're on Metal Massacre too with the song that me and Jim Keeler wrote called Rivet Head. And 
we wrote the, the music we wrote seriously, but the lyrics, we just kind of wrote, we were just goofing around with the lyrics and uh, it ended up, we, we ended up liking them, but we actually kind of were writing them to just be funny, kind of tongue in cheek. Mm -hmm. And we ended up recording it and we brought it to LA for, uh, or sent it to Brian Slagle at Metal Blade. And lo and behold, we sent him four songs and he really liked that one. So, you know, we have Halford hanging around with us and singing on stage with us. And now we're going to be on Metal Massacre 2. Things are kind of looking up, but um, we had some offers to go to L.A. and play. We had uh, Alan Niven was interested in managing us. Uh, and the other guys didn't want to go play in L.A. They didn't think that they could compete there. And I was saying we didn't have to move there, but we should go there and play. Sure. And, uh, they were really against it. So I kept pushing. So they kicked me out. <laughs> kick, me out, kick me out of my own band oh no but you know in hindsight to me i think you would be right because i mean you think about having rob halford behind you you're on that album yeah. which i think had Ahmed saints and i think overkill was on that that volume two i mean so it's bands that made it you probably would have had a better chance going to la than staying back home so to speak well we had been offered to open at to play at the country club which is a premier place to play in the la area in mm -hmm. reseda and i played there a number of times after i moved to la um, we were offered to be on the bill opening for Hughes and Thrall hmm. and uh, he didn't want to go. And right. I was like, you got to be kidding me. And their philosophy, and these guys are all good friends of mine. It's not, I'm not bagging on them, right. but their philosophy was they would rather be a big fish in a little pond. And I, my thing was, I thought that had a limited shelf life. I mean, you have a limited shelf life being a fish in a big pond. Sure. So, you know, you only have X amount of time to make that work. Right. So I really was kind of pushing for, you know, yeah, being big in Phoenix was great. And I enjoyed that. And I'd been in a couple bands. Uh, St. Michael had been a popular band in Phoenix. So I knew what that was like. But I also knew that, you know, people are fickle. Whatever the next musical thing that comes down the road two or three years later, you could be out as quick as you're in. That's so true. And so uh, I pushed pretty hard. I mean, they just didn't see the advantage of it at the time. They thought that they could just play. We used to play at like bingo halls and we'd rent our own places, ice skating rinks or uh, roller skating rinks. And they thought they could do that. And they did for a while, right. but after a while, you know, it's, you see, you know, why go see a band that you can see next month anyway. Sure. That makes so sense. It just got to be where it kind of petered out. And Jeff eventually moved to LA and they all did other musical things. Matter of fact, Jimmy Taft, the drummer in Atomic Kings with me, played in a band with the guitar player from Surgical Steel, Paul uh, Kasanovich, mm -hmm. rest in peace. Mm -hmm. um, so it was all, you know, it was all kind of intermingled in there. Right. Now, when you got kicked out of Surgical Steel, was that when you, right around that time, joined uh, Steeler with Ron Keel? I uh, moved to LA. I was pissed off. I moved to LA. <laughs> No band for me to be in in Phoenix, and I said, "Well, I'll just I'll show you guys. I'll go to LA and I'll make it big." Right. <laughs> so I, I went to LA, and I had a couple roommates who that I had known through Surgical Steel, and we tried to put a band together, but it was moving too slow for me. Okay. And uh, I wanted to be, you know, playing out right away. So um, I did a couple other things. I was in rap for fifteen. Oh, minutes. really? Okay. Yeah. When they were Juan was still in in dock and yeah and they were looking for bass players and i auditioned and i got that gig um did you play any shows with them no i ended up getting pneumonia i wasn't i didn't realize i had asthma and mm -hmm. all of a sudden i'm living right by the i'm coming from the desert living right by the ocean sure. and i ended up getting pneumonia for like four months oh, so wow. um, i only rehearsed with them like three or four times and they end up getting a guy named Joey Chris mm -hmm. and it was all cool. Oh. I, I, then I joined Legs Diamond for a little bit mm -hmm. and I did a tour with them in Texas, which they're like Led Zeppelin in Texas. They're okay. huge. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but again, they weren't playing in LA. Right. And then uh, a friend of mine was playing drums for Ron Keel or uh, for Steeler. Right. And he said, Hey, you want to help us audition uh, guitar players? And I said, yeah, I'll do it, but I don't want to be in the band. And I went down and I helped them audition guitar players. And I kind of saw, you know, I didn't really get Ron when I seen him play live. I'd seen Steeler a couple of times, but when I was rehearsing with them, I realized, and this guy's like a serious professional musician, the pro, even the auditions were severely super professional. Mm. 
is not the right word, were, were uh, really professional. And he had a game plan right down to the smallest detail. And I thought, this guy really kind of has it together. So I still didn't ask to be in the band, but he took me to dinner after I helped him audition guitar players and said, I really want you to be in the band. And I said, look, dude, I don't really play like anyone. I, I'm kind of in this 70s, <laughs> you know, John Entwistle meets Tim Bogart, Jack Bruce sort of. Good stuff. You know, mm -hmm. here. I'm not really, you know, you know, play, play pedal on the E and sing a, sing a little bit and smile. It's not my deal. And he said, I don't care. That's what I want someone that's different. Right. Because I'm, I kind of, I'll probably overplay in your songs. I mean, it's, he said, no, that's what I want. So I did it. And I was in the band for about hmm, maybe a year and a half. We played everywhere. We headlined everywhere. Uh, we should have got a record deal. We didn't. Um, oddly enough, I ended up leaving because I got an offer to be in Michael Shanker's band to tour with him. Okay. And Ron was going to maybe do Black Sabbath. Well, the Black okay. Sabbath thing fell through and Michael Shanker thing fell through for me. Shanker, something happened and he had to, he was off the grid for about a year or so. So I was kind of like left with nothing to do. Ron goes out and gets a, a record deal with the same songs that we had been doing in Steel. Right. Right. And so I, Got my, you know, Ron asked for some musicians. I helped him get my brother, Kenny. And also Brian Jay was my roommate. The one I told you when I first moved to LA, I was in a band with a couple of guys. Brian Jay was one of them. And Dwayne Miller was uh, their eventual drummer. And uh, these are all guys I kind of hooked Ron up with and they went on to do that. And, and that was great. And I just kind of bided my time playing in as many bands as I possibly could right. till something came along. Was there ever any talk of you joining Kill? No, I think uh, when I joined Steeler, the deal was Ron and I would be equal partners. Okay. So we would share everything uh, as far as financially, the press, the way the band was perceived. And he agreed to that. And I think when he decided to do Kiel, it was now called Kiel. And um, the other guys in the band, you know, we're all great musicians and, and members of the band. But I think if you look at the way that a lot of that went down, 99% of the interviews are with Ron. It's Ron's huh. perspective. And I, he would have never been able to do that with me in the band. I mean, to deal with him and I was 50-50. Right. Um, I'm pretty assertive. I'm, I'm a type A type person. <laughs> so there was... Mm -hmm. No way around that. I think Ron liked playing with me and I liked playing with him. Right. We wrote some great songs. There's, I think I have songs on two or three of the first Keel records right. um, I co-wrote. Um, but I just think he wanted younger musicians that he could kind of mold, guys who hadn't really been on the scene. You know, my brother Kenny and Dwayne hadn't really, they were from Phoenix. They moved out to LA to be in Keel. So they had played in Phoenix, but mostly just parties. Right. So now so they're in a band, they're in a signed band. My roommate, Brian Jay, had played out a little bit, but nothing at the level that Ron was doing. Hell, when I moved to LA, I had never played at stuff at the level that, that Steeler was doing, you know, playing at the country club, playing at Perkins Palace and, and doing all these shows. I mean, we did probably four or five shows a month. We went up to San Francisco, up to the Bay Area there, played a lot of times up there open for YNT for about five or six shows, did shows with Metallica. Nice. So, you know, I went from playing at Kager's <laughs> to all of a sudden playing in real places with real music industry people there. Right. And, you know, in Phoenix, you know, there was no music industry people checking out bands at that time. Sure, sure. It was a big deal. And I think, I think Ron made the right decision. I mean, he put together a bunch of really good musicians and he was in charge of it. He really knew what he wanted. Obviously, they were successful right. to a certain extent. And, uh, you know, they toured and played all the right places and did all that stuff. And he still got it that going on now. So yeah. it's great for my brother. I was thrilled to see my brother and Dwayne. Um, Dwayne's a really good friend of mine. Um, have success. You know, people from Phoenix weren't going to L.A. and being that successful sure. at that time. Right, right. That place. And even with Dwayne, uh, I mean, with uh, Brian J, um, you know, just a South Bay guy. Now, now he's in a band that's got a record deal. He's going to Europe and he's going to Japan. That, I was super stoked for those guys. I wanted my turn too. Of course. You know, I was 
but I was, you know, it's my brother, Kenny. I mean, he's, he's uh, my closest in my age. I, I gave him his first bass. So oh, nice. I kind of infected him with this bass playing. Thing. <laughs> oh, that's great. He, I still talk. He lives here in town. I talk to him quite a bit. That's awesome. So now, I totally, totally 100% understands what you were saying with Ron Keel and how being in that band would have been a different dynamic for you. But then right around that time, maybe a year or two later, you auditioned for Ozzy, right? Which was obviously Ozzy's a solo artist. So what made you decide, hey, you know, I will go try out for Ozzy and, and kind of be like the, the, the bass player in the background and I'm okay with that? Well, two things really. I mean, it's Ozzy. <laughs> That's what I figured you'd say, yeah? Hard to beat Ozzy. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about going, you're going to be a headlining the world stage. You're not just going to be, you know, also featuring such and such. Now you're Ozzy Osbourne, whatever blizzard, but whatever he's calling it at that time. And the other reason is because Jake was in the band. I had, uh, I had seen Jake play in LA. I had heard about him. I heard everyone would say, there's Jake Williams. He's the best guitar player in LA. And that always interested me. And I saw him play one night and he was not only the best guitar player in LA, he was the best guitar player I'd ever seen. And I was completely, I don't get this too often, but I saw him play and I was like, holy crap. I mean, his whole stage presence, his tone, the way he played was different than a lot of the LA guitar players, even in the early eighties. And I was like, man, I'd love to be in a band with this guy. Well, out of the blue, I get, there, well, Ozzy did a, uh, they did the uh, thing on MTV where they were looking for a bass player. Send in your yep. tape and your pro- and your picture and your promo packet. So I wasn't even going to do it. And Ross Halfen, a photographer, yep. was a friend of mine. He said, "You got to do it." And so I put together the cheesiest package. I had a good picture. <laughs> I wrote up something and I sent a, a a video of me playing the bass to a song on my freaking ghetto blaster. I didn't even know what I'm going through. <laughs> Okay. And out of the blue, I get a call saying, you know, from Sharon Osborne, we'd like you to come and audition. And I said, uh, well, actually, first I told her to screw off because I thought it was Bobby Blotzer playing a trick on her. <laughs> That's great. And I hung up on her. Oh, no. So she called me back uh-huh. and she's like, Greg, this is Sharon Osborne. We'd really like you to come and audition for all these band. And I'm like, Blotzer, damn it, this isn't funny. <laughs> hung up on her again and she calls back and she goes greg it's really a sharon osborne and if you hang up again i'm not calling you back (laughs) Uh oh oh so i said okay and uh i thought they were auditioning in la because when they had auditioned drummers at one point before that i knew some friends that had went down and auditioned for the for Ozzy's band in LA. Sure. So I said, well, where and when? And she said, uh, we're going to fly you to England and um, the audition will be in the UK. And I said, eh, I don't like flying. And, I, and the rumor was that Jake was out of the band. And but so this I was is thinking, before the ultimate sin, right? Before the ultimate okay. sin, but there had been a rumor going around that he was out of the band. Right, okay. And I said, well, you know, I don't really like London. And keep in mind, I've never been to London at okay, that right. point. Mm-hmm. I was just making it up because I don't like flying. Right. And uh, I said, and besides that, Jake's not really in the band. I don't know. She said, no, Jake's in the band. I said, he is? Mm-hmm. And uh, she said, no, yeah, he's in the band. I said, okay. She, I, she said, well, we'll fly, we'll fly you to England. I said, well, I don't know. She, I don't know about going to England. And she said, well, you're only going to be in England for like long enough to change planes because then I'm going to fly you to Inverness, we're going to fly you to Inverness, Scotland. Oh, and I said, my bulldog's over here trying to get on camera. That's right. <laughs> uh, I said, uh, Inverness, isn't that by Loch Ness? And she said, yeah. I said, okay, Sharon, here's the deal. I'll come to Scotland if someone will take me to see Loch Ness. <laughs> the Loch Ness is where I want to look for it. She, she said, okay. So, you know, I always tell the story. I didn't have anything going on. My career was like at a complete standstill and I'm making, I'm bartering or making some <laughs> kind of, you know, agreement with Sharon Osborne, one of the most powerful people in the industry. <laughs> okay, if you do what I want, I'll come to Scotland and audition for your damn Ozzy Osborne band. <laughs> so what so, happens? Yeah, I, 
I, I flew over there and uh -huh. they took me to see Loch Ness. I was there for about 21 days. I didn't get the gig, uh -huh. but I got to, uh, we played every day, you know, as far as it was me, Jake and, and Randy Castillo uh -huh. and uh, rest his soul. Uh -huh. And um, Ozzy came in and Ozzy loved my playing, but he just didn't think I had the correct look. And he's probably right. I don't, didn't really, I had the whole big hair thing going on at the time, but uh -huh. I'm kind of, he thought I looked like Charles Bronson in The Mechanic. Okay. Which I'm fine with that. I, I kind of had that rugged, ugly man thing going on. Mm -hmm. And Ozzy didn't think that that fit the image, you know, what, of what they were doing at the time. And in, in that point, at, at that point in music, it kind of was that way, the whole MTV thing. Sure. So it was disappointing to find out that he thought I was a great bass player. But, you know, how can I... There's no way I was going to get better looking. <laughs> I said, you're not a very good bass player. I go home and work on that. Right. You know, going home and getting better looking. I'm not exactly sure what the procedure is for that. <laughs> and I'm not sure if that happens. Certainly. <laughs> well, maybe you should have auditioned for Ozzy like 20 years later when um, Zach Wilde was there and he was rugged. You guys would have made a perfect pair. Well, the funny part is when I was in Badlands, Jake made a bunch of mention about that. I didn't get the gig for Ozzy because Ozzy didn't think that I had the right look. And so Ozzy kind of took some heat for that. Mm -hmm. And so years later, you know, after Badlands, my buddy Joe Holmes was playing guitar for Ozzy. Mm -hmm. And Ozzy was looking for a bass player and Joe Holmes recommended me. Mm -hmm. And um, so Sharon called me, I was living back here in Phoenix and she's like, uh, hey, you know, hey Greg, and we'd like you to, we heard you're really great and Joe says you're the man and we'd like you to come and audition for the band. And I said, really? And uh, she said, yeah, are you available? I said, you don't remember me, do you? And she <laughs> said, no, I don't think well, have we have met. I said, well, I came and auditioned for Ozzy for the ultimate sin and I didn't get the gig. She went, really? I said, yeah. And then I joined Badlands with Jake and there was some press about how I didn't get the gig because Ozzy didn't think I had the right look. And she said, it was like, huh, let me call you back, she said. And then <laughs> I never heard from her again. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I knew I was, I knew that that was going to be the case. Even if they, even if my looks, my lack of glam was not an issue. Right. The fact that there had been a bunch of press about Ozzy not wanting me to be in a band because of my. Right. He didn't want to bring that up again. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> oh man but obviously through that you must have stayed in touch with jakey e. lee right because i'm assuming that's the connection getting you into badlands eventually right so how did you stay in touch with jake during that time we kind of hit it off while i was uh in scotland we have a lot of the same interests and um so when i didn't get the gig uh i was actually back in uh la and he he called me and said hey you're not going to get the gig which i already knew i wasn't mm -hmm. um uh but um, he said, you know, I really like your plan. Someday I'll leave, when I leave Ozzy, I'll call you up and, you know, I'd like you to possibly be involved in whatever my next thing is. So through that, we, we just managed to stay friends. He would call me from the road if he was bored. He, Jake's a night owl, so he'd call me at like four, four in the morning. It could be four in the morning and, and, you know, in Japan and he's calling me or it could be four in the morning in LA and I'm asleep and he calls. Right. But we would always talk. <laughs> When he'd come home on a break, we'd get together, he'd come over for dinner, we'd go hang out, whatever. Um, Jake and I are kind of, we would be friends even if we weren't musicians. Right. The fact that we're musicians and we got to be in a band together and all that is just kind of like a little bit of the extra icing on the cake. Sure. But Jake's one of those kind of guys and, and everyone has friends like that. You would be friends with them regardless of what your business connection with them. Is. Without a doubt. So he calls you and he tells you, Hey, I'm starting this band Badlands and I'd like you to come in and be a part of it. Is was it as simple as that? Um, well, when he left, he kind of kicked around as Jake does. He kind of took his time figuring out how he wanted to do it. And he wanted to get a singer first. Mm -hmm. So he, he uh, arranged for through a number of phone calls to have Ray come out mm -hmm. And Ray brought Eric, uh, Eric lived in LA at the time and they'd been together in Sabbath. So uh, the three of them got together and I think there was a bass player there. It wasn't me. For, I don't think I could do it or I didn't want to do it or something else was going on. I can't remember. And he really liked Ray's voice and he also really liked Eric's drums and he played me 
some of the tapes they've made and I thought they were pretty right on. Mm. And then he wanted me to audition and I didn't want to, all my friends knew that I was friends with him. And I thought, man, if I audition for this gig and I don't get it, I'm going to look like an idiot. <laughs> I, I just, I told Jake, I said, look, um, I don't really want to audition. He said, well, you didn't think I was just going to give you the gig, did you? And I said, yeah, my bad. But yeah, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. He said, well, no, I, I want you to audition because I know other people too. And I said, okay, audition everyone you want. And you, if you can't find someone you like, call me. So after they'd auditioned X amount of people, maybe I, don't, I thought the number was somewhere in the 40s. Oh, wow. He called me and said, are you going to come down or not? I said, yeah, I'll come down. And I went down and auditioned. I ended up auditioning more than once. Okay. And Jake liked me right off the bat, but it took the other guys a couple of times. And uh, I eventually got the gig. And it wasn't called Badlands at the time. It was just Jake's putting together a band. Okay. But I really liked what they had. I liked, I thought Eric was a great drummer. I mean, Ray's the best singer of his generation, in my opinion. Agreed, yeah. Jake, Jake's still my favorite guitarist. Mm -hmm. So I was thrilled to be part of that, you know, to be playing with musicians of that caliber. I mean, you, you, there's some great stuff with that. There's also some pitfalls when you're playing with guys like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, or playing with a guy like me. There's, there's obviously some interesting obstacles you have to navigate okay. but 99 percent of it was just amazing and it's great to be in a band like that so i mean anybody who loves rock music like we do knows that critical part of any successful band is that rhythm section the drummer the bass player right so how is it for you going in playing with eric singer eric was weird to play with at first i'd never played with and and now that you know as time has gone by i actually realized what he was doing Eric doesn't pay any attention to the bass player. He only, he plays with the guitar player. Okay. And the bass player kind of just falls in. Well, I had never played with someone like that. So I thought Eric and I were going to write all these parts together. And Eric just said, I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do. Do whatever you want to do that goes along with me. So he's playing with Jake and Eric's very consistent. He, once he gets the part the way he wants it, he plays it the same way every time. And so, um, I just started tailoring my parts to him, to what he played, because like I said, he played the same stuff every time. So after I figured out exactly how we did it, it was actually really easy for me to play with him. Gotcha. That makes sense. Now, I believe during the time that you guys were recording that album, which was like late 88, early 89 time period, Eric went off late. and he was touring with Paul Stanley. During this. Was there any concern he was going to leave and, and not be part of Badlands? No, I, I, Eric really liked being in Badlands and uh, he already had the Paul Stanley thing. It, it had already, when he was auditioning or whatever, for Eric's the only drummer that auditioned for Badlands okay. in the original band. No, what Jake didn't see another drummer, I don't think. Oh, wow. And, um, but he said the caveat is I have this Paul Stanley tour that I agreed to do already. Are, are you guys okay with it? And we were like, sure, whatever. We were still in the writing process, in the writing phase of things. And we didn't even have a manager or I don't think we had a manager at that point. I think we were still talking to managers, talking to record companies. So Eric went off and did that. And as a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure Jake and I went and, and saw him play with Paul Stanley, nice. wherever they played in LA. I can't remember where they played, but mm -hmm. went. And uh, I think Eric, the Paul Stanley thing was cool. And it's a money gig. And obviously it probably helped. <laughs> Put him where he is today. Where he is now. <laughs> yeah. Um, because Paul's doing that other weird thing that he's doing right now, the lounge lounge lizard thing. And, yep. and Eric's doing that too. Yep. So obviously, uh, Eric's a great drummer. I mean, Eric is so consistent. His meter's perfect. Uh, he very seldom makes a mistake. And all the time I've known him, I mean, I can't even remember a mistake. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can set your watch. To Eric Singer. <laughs> he'll he'll be, appreciate that comment because he loves watches. <laughs> he does. I, I, I used to stay at his house when I do records in LA and he would show me all these watches he had. He has, had a really good watch collection, but mm -hmm. Eric's timing is impeccable. He's a lot better drummer than people ever get to see mm -hmm. with him and Kiss. Nothing against Kiss. No, don't you're right. Me, you're right. Don't send me cards and letters. <laughs> um, he's an amazing drummer, great singer, mm -hmm. uh, and he's probably the perfect team player 
when he's playing with someone like Kiss or when he was in Alice Cooper or Gary Moore or Brian May, all these guys he's played with, he is the kind of guy that fits in perfect with that because he knows kind of what the parameters are, the boundaries are, and he knows exactly where to be. He's kind of like the consummate hired musician, side man guy. I know he's in Kiss and right. everything, but... Yeah, but but you your know. point is well made. Yeah, I, I agree. And but you had him... Gene, it's Gene and Paul's show. Eric exactly. knows where that boundary is. Now, I'm sure Eric writes his own parts because when he was in uh, Badlands, he wrote all those parts and right. they're... I don't, none of us could come up with stuff as crazy. <laughs> right. And then you even had him on your 94 solo album as well, right? So after he had left Badlands in like 1991, you obviously stayed in touch with him <clears throat> enough to have him come back on your solo album. Well, Eric and I didn't get along while we, while we were in Badlands for probably 90% of the time. Oh, wow. We just didn't get along. And uh, Eric's very stubborn, and so am I. Mm -hmm. Eric was, an, I was not Eric's first choice to be in the band. And, uh, Eric was not going to back off of that. Well, I'm not backing off anything either. Mm -hmm. And so as, as confrontational as that relationship was, uh, acrimonious, whatever, we still played together great. Right. And, you know, our road manager at the time would say, you know, people come to the show to see Jake and Ray, and they come away saying how great Jake and Ray is, but they also come away saying how great you guys are. Yep. And I was like, that's, that's good to know. So we always played together well. We were always professional. We never had an issue on stage. We didn't really hang out much. <clears throat> and near the end of the first tour, I knew Eric was in trouble with the other guys. And I didn't say anything about it because it wasn't my place. But um, near the end of the first tour, I just said, you know, dude, we just did all these dates together, all these months, and people think we're great. You know, it really sucks that we're not even remotely friends. And we became friends. Mm. And then, you know, a few months later, he ends up getting, you know, removed from the band. And uh, he wasn't happy about it. And I don't blame him. And uh, But it, it kind of was what it was. And then he joined Alice Cooper. But because him and I had kind of made friends before all this happened, he would call me, we would get together. He has, he has muscle cars. I have muscle cars. We would go to car shows together. We would hang out. It was a great friendship. So when I was doing my solo record, I said, Hey, I'm doing this. I don't have a lot of dough. Are you interested? I said, we made a great record in Badlands. We didn't even we hate each other. <laughs> Let's make a record when we're actually friends and see how that worked. <laughs> so we rehearsed at his house. He had an extra addition to his house. We rehearsed in there. And it was great. We had a great time. He co-wrote some of the material with me. Uh, we were like buddies. I, I really enjoyed playing with him. That's awesome. And then something happened later on where something got taken out of con. I actually got blamed for something that I didn't say. Mm. And on those uh, the re-releases re of the Badlands cds mm -hmm. off of whatever the name of that label was overseas i can't remember right but they right. they put together a big booklet and they i had some quotes in there and they quoted me as saying a few things about eric that i didn't say mm -hmm. they just kind of put my name on him and eric got mad and we've never talked since i've tried to talk to him but i'd be friends with him. if eric called me today i'd talk to him but i'm not holding my breath but he's a great drummer the times i've been around with him when we were friends he's great and the times we hated each other didn't really bother me. I mean, I just went about my business. He went about his. Right. Now you right. Hey, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, if you're watching, he didn't say those things. Give him a buzz. But um, Eric, call me. <laughs> there you go. You mentioned before, though, the tour that you guys did for that album. I remember seeing you guys in New York City with Tesla and Great White. And to me, I always said that was an amazing tour. It was the first time I remember as a teenager going into my early 20s, going to a show that wasn't a festival with three bands that were in my book, top notch. What do you remember about that tour? Well, all for sure, Tesla and Great White were at their peak. I mean, they were at, were at their kind of commercial, whatever I hate to use that word, mm -hmm. record selling peak. They were coming off 3 million selling records or whatever. And we were kind of just, you know, at the very beginning of our thing. And, um, but there was a lot of hype about us right. uh, because of Jake. 
and then because of Ray. So we got along really good with with those bands. I used to hang around with Brian Wheat quite a, quite a bit in Tesla, mm-hmm. and uh, and Frank Hannon. Yep. And it was everything was very professional. These guys had been doing this for a long time. They'd been on the arena. They were like on their second or third time around doing their A markets again. Where'd you see us at? Which venue? Uh, I think it was called the Reebok River Stage in Manhattan. It was right near the Intrepid in the city. Yeah, the outdoor there. place. Yep. Yeah, that was a great place. We played. It's still daytime. Yes, it was. And, uh, when we played. Yeah, and uh, we always had, we always ninety nine point nine times we always had a great show. Um, they always had great shows. Uh, we only played. I think we played maybe an hour set, maybe less. Yeah. And they were switching off every show. That one one show would be Tesla would be the headliner the yeah. next day, would be Great White, and we were always the opener. But yeah, they treated us great. Um, I'm still friends with some of those guys to this day. That's awesome. And uh, uh, Audie Desbro is a friend of mine. Uh, Tony, the bass player, is a good friend of mine. I'm still friends with Jack, mm-hmm. and I'm still friends with Frank and and uh, Troy Lucetta. So it. Uh, it was a great experience. It was my first experience playing those kind of venues. Sure. <clears throat> so I was having a great time. I mean, I'm going from, you know, it took me a long time to kind of get there. You know, it was at 88. I'd been in LA since 82. Mm-hmm. So it was 89. Actually. Sure. sure. So it was like not taking it for granted. Without a doubt. So and I'm, the amazing I'm thing true. to me is, you know, as a rock fan at that time, I knew the album. Like you said, obviously everybody knew Jake's name from Ozzy. Um, I liked the album in 89, 90, 91, um, but it seems like that album has even grown in stature in the last like 30 years, right? I think even Rolling Stone about a year or two ago put out a list of like their top hair metal albums and the Badlands debut album was number 35 on the list, which I was like, that's pretty cool to see all these years later, the band still getting the recognition in my mind they deserve. And whenever I post online on my Facebook page about all the different music I do on a daily basis, when I, when that anniversary of that Badlands album comes, it's an onslaught of people. This is the best debut album. Does that kind of give you like some satisfaction? You look back and you say, man, this album's really stood the test of time. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that Jake would feel the same way. And I, and I know Eric's a little weird about it, but I, I'm sure that he's proud of the music we made and the legacy that it kind of has as far as the record itself. Um, I always equate it to that first Montrose record. Mm-hmm. The first Montrose record when it first came out, it just, you know, it got some attention. If you were a, a rock yep. guy, you liked, I had it. Everyone I knew had it. But it was a guitar player record, more or less. And uh, over the course of time, it grew in stature. It eventually sold, kept selling records on and on. And I'm sure if that Badlands record was available to be sold, I'm sure we would have a gold record many years ago by it because we're just, just a few short of gold anyway. But uh, it's kind of uh, gratifying to know that people still, that that music st- stands the test of time and that people, I get people saying how much it changed their lives and this and that. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. I, it's I, I'm- I was gonna say, I personally to- don't feel it was a hair metal ba- band. You know, that's just my, right, exactly. There's great blues, Led Zeppelin influences in there. To me, that was never hair metal. We had long hair, right? but we really wanted to be you know, we wanted to be Zeppelin. Right. You know, so Ray was a huge Zeppophile. So is Eric. Uh, I mean, Jake and I obviously have uh, affinity towards Zeppelin. There's also a lot of other influences on that first Badlands record. It is bluesier than uh, anything that uh, we, you know, Jake was known for playing in Aussie, you know, worldwide. And then he does a record like Badlands, which is completely different than the music he wrote in Aussie. And um, so it's got a real 70s bluesy sort of thing to it. And so Jake has a lot of influences, uh, you know, whether it's Tommy Bolin or Frank Marino or, you know, guys that are not, you know, well, obviously Hendrix is a big one, but there's a lot of guys that he's influenced by that aren't your typical guys. Right. Same with my bass playing, same with Eric Strumming. Right. So we kind of mashed all that together to make that first Badlands record. And it's intentionally meant to be very 70s we didn't want to sell out and do you know we're going to be 70s but we're going to do a commercial the most commercial song we ever did was dreams in the dark and it's right. still pretty damn 70s. 
Agreed. And I think that's one of the reasons that album stands the test of time because you don't put it on and it doesn't sound like it's just a time capsule of 1986. It really, it's, it's great music. That to me is timeless. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, it means a lot to me. When you're making a record, you don't know what you're getting. Of course. You know, you make the best record you can and hopefully someone gets it. And the fact that actually both the first set, the first two records kind of <clears throat> are held in such high esteem by everyone means a lot to, to me. Yeah. And uh, and even a lot of people that discover the third Badlands record, Dusk, yep. that, that also... Be- because it wasn't on a, it didn't get a major release anywhere. It's never been released in this country. Right. Um, the people that find it really appreciate it. And then you can hear when you're listening to the first record, you can hear the progression to the second record, and then you can hear the progression to where we were headed, you know, had we done a real recording and real release of the third record. And you actually started participating more in the songwriting with the second and third album. And I think it's on the Dusk album, whereas the song The River, which, which you wrote, and I think is a, an important song for you as well, right? Yeah. I mean, I actually wrote that song for the second record. Yeah, okay. And Ray wouldn't, Ray was like, yeah, whatever. He wouldn't listen to it. Hmm. And I did get a couple songs on the second record. And then uh, when we were doing the songs for Dusk, you know, we, at the time it wasn't called Dusk. We were just doing demos for our, eventual third Badlands record. And uh, Jake gave it to Ray and said, you should listen to this. This is a pretty good song. And Ray did, and it actually fit, you know, right up his alley there. So um, we ended up doing it for the third record. And I, I had a couple other tracks that um, were rough, rougher takes, which is why they didn't end up on dust. They were less complete than the other ones. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, I like Jake's songwriting. So it was never a, a thing where, hey, man, I got a bunch of songs. Um, how come no one listens to my songs? Right. Um, for the second record, Jake said, why don't you write a couple of things? So I did. He liked them. And for the third record, same thing. Mm-hmm. Now, a funny thing is I joined a band after Badlands called Die Happy, yep. uh, which is a Christian band. And, but they're kind of have a very kind of Badlands bent to them. And... Uh, I co-wrote most of the songs on there. And when I gave it to Jake, he listened to it. And he said, you can write all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. He goes, I should have had you write more. Oh man. So <laughs> I just really liked the way he wrote. He, he was saying everything I wanted to say. I had a pretty much a blank canvas as far as the bass was go, sure. going to be. He wasn't saying, no, don't do this, do that. He would make suggestions sometimes like for example, the intro to dreams in the dark, is played an octave higher than I originally played it. Okay. It's the same intro, that boom, that, but I was playing it an octave lower. He said, play that up an octave higher. Right. And he was right. So, I mean, I always listened to what he had to say. And conversely, if I had something to say, he was more than uh, willing to listen to what any of the other guys had to say. Right. And he'd go, he'd go, as he, <laughs> I like that. Right. Yeah. And, then, and then that's how we kind of go. Right. Now, obviously, you've kept in touch with Jake because for a little while we were in Red Dragon Cartel, right? And then unfortunately, you got sick. So before you even address the time with Red Dragon Cartel, how is your health and is everything okay with that? Yeah, I've been cancer free. Uh, it'll be six years in October. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Very good to hear. You. Yes. And uh, I have some residual effects from having stage four cancer Mm -hmm. and some surgeries done. But I mean, all in all, I'm above ground. Any day above ground is better than any day below it. And that's true. I'm alive. I always say I'm around a bitch about it. So (laughs) I'd rather be bitching about it than taking a dirt nap somewhere. (laughs) That's for sure. Now it is never a good time to come down with cancer, obviously, but unfortunate for you, you had pretty much just started working with Jake again in Red Dragon Cartel. Um, So how did your involvement with that come to you? Was again, him just picking up the phone with you and saying, Hey, great, come on, come join me in this new, new project I'm working on. Jake was kind of off the grid for a while. Yep. And um, we didn't really talk. I mean, I think there was probably about a five year period where we didn't really communicate. Um, he was dealing with his stuff. I was dealing with mine. Uh, I kind of got out of the music business intentionally. I wanted to be a dad. My kids were around. I did all the, the coaching up there for them and was very involved in that. And we would talk after a while, we would talk every now and then. 
And uh, then he was telling me that he was going to do a record. And he would like me to play on it, except the guy that owned the studio, Ron Mancuso, or, or I think that's his name. The caveat to use the studio was that he got to play bass on it. Well, he's not a bass player, he's a guitar player. Okay. So Jake agreed to do it. It wasn't that big a deal. And I, I wasn't worried about it. And then Jake also had a few other people come, you know, Scott Reeder played on a song and uh, Tom Peterson played on a song and uh, wasn't, wasn't the, I, I think I might've even offered to do it, okay. but I was busy. He was busy and the record came out. I liked it, but he wasn't, um, thrilled with some of the bass stuff and they were actually doing shows and that wasn't going off the way that he wanted it. So he called me and said, Hey, we're going to be playing in Arizona and Phoenix in Phoenix area in March. Um, and they'd done some touring already, but they were taking a break. Would you like to play at this show? I actually hadn't seen him since like maybe 2000. Oh, wow. So I actually hadn't seen him in that long. I said, uh, sure. And he sent me a set list. There was some Aussie on it, some Badlands, and then some Red Dragon Cartel. And I learned it and we got together and rehearsed. He came to Phoenix, we rehearsed. And it was like we had been playing together all that time. We immediately clicked right, right off the bat. It was always a thing with Jake and I is we kind of have this, uh, I know what he's looking for. He knows what I'm looking for, you know, type thing. So when he's right. playing something, I kind of know exactly what he wants. Right, right. And uh, when I'm listening to him, he's playing exactly what I would, if I could come up with something, that would be. Right, it. sure. And when we got back together, we played and we did a jam for about 45 minutes. Oh, wow. Jake loves mm -hmm. jam, so do I. Mm -hmm. And it's not jamming on a Motley Crue song. It's jamming on a riff made out of thin air. Right, nice. <laughs> So we jam, we jam and the drummer Jonas was there and Darren the singer was singing and it was awesome and we got done and Jake said, ah, now that's jamming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I did the show, it went off pretty good. Uh, I had a great time and he said, I want you to be in the band. Right. <laughs> and I said, I have commitments till August. Okay. You still want me to be in the band in August, call me. And so he called me first, August 1st, you want to do it? I said, yeah, I'll do it. I, my kids were older. They had never seen me on, you know, the bigger stage. Sure. They'd seen me play locally around here. They had never seen me in that setting. So I agreed to do it. Uh, started rehearsing in October. Did, I don't know, 40, 45 shows total. Mm -hmm. But I was sick the whole time. Right. I, I did, and I didn't know what was wrong with me. I'm, I'm kind of a health nut. I don't do drugs. I don't drink. I don't smoke. So I couldn't figure out. Why am I, you know, why do I have a fever all the time? Why, why don't I, you know, why does my throat hurt all the time? Mm -hmm. And it took a lot, it took me until that spring of 2015 to get diagnosed correctly that, yeah, mm -hmm. by the way, you, it took my lymph nodes swelling up like a golf ball mm -hmm. I, I, for a doctor to finally say, yeah, you might have cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, by then I already guessed I did have it. Right. I just mm -hmm. didn't know what kind. And so uh, what I did is uh, I knew I was sick and I wasn't getting diagnosed right. So I told Jake, I called him. I said, hey, look, I can't go on the road. They had shows going on in April. I got my work, you know, mm -hmm. I got other stuff going on. But I, really, I knew I was sick. I just wanted someone to diagnose it. Right. And, and so I finally got it diagnosed correctly. And by then he, he had Anthony playing bass and that was cool. And I called him up and I said, hey, by the way, I have stage four cancer. Hmm. He said, are you? He goes, no, you're joking. Hmm. No, I'm not. That's, what, that's why I can't go. That's hmm. why. So I immediately went and had surgery. And then I went through four months, four and a half months of treatment. Well, you know, they were on tour and doing their thing. Right. That was great. Yeah, I missed it because I like playing with them. And I like the other guys in the band too. Mm -hmm. uh, Darren and I are still good friends. I like Jonas. But if I hadn't have done it, I probably wouldn't have had it completely checked out till the tour was over. Well, when they did find it in April, I only had eight months to live then. Ooh. So if I had waited till October, right. we wouldn't be having this conversation. Obviously, so you made was, the right decision. We made the right decision, and and you know he was cool with it. We're still great friends, and you know maybe someday at some point we'll play together again. I don't, you know, I 
I don't know what he's doing at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I know they had shows to do, but they got canceled along with everyone else's shows. Right, right, of course. Do you think there's ever a chance he would look to resurrect Badlands? Obviously, Ray's no longer with us, right? But Jeff could come in on drums, yourself, Jake, and, and maybe somebody else, or let that be? You know, he's always said that he would never do it without Ray. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I know Never's a long time, but I do know Jake is a man of his word. And uh, I don't, can never see him saying Badlands. Mm -hmm. So, you know, could he go out and say, Jakey e. Lee plays the music of Ozzy in Badlands? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. I mean, right. I, I mean, I don't know what the semantics of that would be, uh, you know, how that would work, the logistics of it. Um, I mean, he could do whatever he wants. And if he, if he was doing that, and if he, if he did to say, I want to reform Badlands, he knows I'm just a phone call away. And if he wanted to do something else, he knows I'm a phone call away. And if he wanted me to do something with him right now, he knows I'm a phone call away. I mean, like I said, we're, we're kind of like brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have kind of this musical mind meld thing going on, Vulcan mind meld thing going on. Mm -hmm. And if I never play with him again, I'll, I'll be, it'll, you know, I'll be grateful for the times I did play with him. Mm -hmm. And if I do play with him again, I'll have a good time when I do that. I mean, I would always do what I'm doing now with Atomic Kings, mm -hmm. but uh, Jake has a special place for, you know, in my musical heart. And so I'm always open to whatever he has to say. Yep. And I want to talk Atomic Kings, but one more question, if you don't mind, since you were talking about Ray, um, looking back on that, I believe he was getting sick somewhere in like around the 1990 time period. We know he passed in 1993. Did that impact anything during like the recording of your second album, Voodoo Highway? Did you guys know he was sick or did it happen for you guys suddenly? Uh, by then, we kind of found out about it before we recorded Voodoo Highway. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he could still sing and he, he you know, he was... I guess he was HIV positive, but he didn't have full blown AIDS at that point. Right. So we just treated him, you know, he didn't like to discuss it. Um, we didn't discuss it. Um, it that was his business. Sure. He kept it to himself. We, we, uh, we allowed him the, the respect to do how he approached that. We went in and did the band. We, we never had, let me rephrase this. We never had a discussion with Ray about it. Right. We okay. never sat down and said, hey, man, but we we had heard that that was the case. And we figured when he was ready to talk about it, then he would let us know about it. Sure. And I don't know if Jake ever had may have had a discussion at some point, but I know I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if Jake would have because I'm sure Jake and I would have talked about it. But we allowed him the respect to come to us when the time was right, right. in his mind right. to say, hey, here's my thing. That didn't happen while he was in the band and and that was his business. So. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, those who are younger who watch this, you know, in 1990, 91, 92, there was this stigma around AIDS that, you know, probably younger people don't understand. Right. So I'm sure he probably dealt with that also knowing that, hey, if I come out, there's going to be this press around this. And, um, you know, I could totally imagine that that weighed on his mind as well. I think Ray this is just my opinion, was in complete denial of it. Hmm. I think that he just, he felt healthy. He looked healthy when we made the first record. He didn't have any issues. Um, Ray wasn't the best at taking care of himself. You know, Ray would be the kind of guy that we'd do a show in Pittsburgh in the wintertime, and you'd go out to go in the bus, and he'd be standing out there in his soaking wet leather pants with no <laughs> shirt on and no shoes. And you know, yeah, Ray, uh, it was like uh, 15 degrees out here right now. Yeah, isn't this great? I'm from New Jersey, I, but that's a true story, by the way. Um, but uh, I just think, and again, this is just my opinion. I don't think Ray believed that he was sick. And uh, I think when he finally did realize that he was, he changed the way he did everything. He was still, you know, showed up, sang every gig, sang every song, sang every take, sang every rehearsal. Um, but I think he realized that he might be going to have a problem. So he's very particular about the record he wanted to make with Voodoo Highway. Mm -hmm. And there was some things he wanted to say 
And to be perfectly honest, I don't think that he was ever 100% happy with how Voodoo Highway turned out because I think there was a statement he was, he personally was looking to make. Now, having said that, you know, Jake and I and Jeff at that point were always, we were making a statement too. Right. But I don't think when you're making a statement, looking at your, mort your own mortality is different. Very different, I'm not. sure, I'm sure. And I think Ray had an inkling that, you know, I, I actually do have this. I don't think he believed he had it before that. Hmm. But after he got sick at the end of our first tour, we had to cancel the, some of our first tour. And then we were supposed to go out with either ACDC or Van Halen. Hmm. All that got thrown away and we just decided to make a second record. Sure. Um, I think that uh, um, he approached his business different then. He right. was much more conscientious of what he was doing. Sure, sure. So, well, you brought up Atomic Kings before. It makes, so. sense, to it makes sense to me. Right. I don't no, know if that, not a, that any, it makes no. sense what you're saying, right? And um, look, we'll never know, right? We never know what's in another person's mind. All you could do is give your opinion. And you said that that's what it was, your opinion. Yeah, it was, it was hard for me that when he died. I got a phone call from Glenn Hughes telling mm -hmm. me, hey, man, uh, Ray passed away. Ray and Glenn were good friends. Ray and I, mm -hmm. Glenn and I are friends. And I was like, we, it was Christmas time. It was December 1st, which is, or December 3rd or 2nd. I know it's right in there because it's right around my brother's mm -hmm. birthday. And we were out looking for Christmas trees. Mm -hmm. And I had my wife let me out of the car. Mm -hmm. And I was about 12 miles from our house and I walked home. It was oh, wow. at night. Then I walked home and she kept driving by. So just go, I need to kind of process this mm -hmm. because um, I knew that there was never going to be an, a hope of us getting back together again at that sure. point. You know, whether who would have played drums, I don't know. Right. But I knew if Ray was alive today, I guarantee you that me and, you know, that him and, Jake and myself would have got together at least more than a bunch of times. So you know, we would have done that. We would have revisited that because, be you know, Ray and I had our problems, but before he died, I sent him a message uh, on his answering machine okay. and talked to him in a while. He sent me a message on my answering machine and we traded messages back and forth. And he said, Hey, I'm in hospital right now. When I get out, I'm going to call you. Everything's cool. Between, between you and I, and then we, we never got to have that conversation. I wish we would have. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of bullshit that went down mm -hmm. be, that I was involved in too. I mean, Ray had his faults. I certainly have mine. I'm, I'm pretty aggressive. Like I said, I'm a type A person. Mm -hmm. If you, you spit on my shoe, I'm probably going to get mad at you. And <laughs> right. mm -hmm. I'm kind of that guy. Right, right. And so, you know, I, I, I want my space and, you know, if you're going to poke me in the eye, you're going to get a response. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had some of that went on between Ray and I, but in the end, that's band crap. And it happens right. all, it happens in every band. Look at, read about any band that's been out there. There's always those difficulties. So we would have got past those. Hell, Jake and I even had a couple of arguments once, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh, we, I'm sure that the three of us would have done something. Right. Right. Um, my opinion. Right. Right. Well, it's it's too bad that that can't be. But yeah. looking on the positive side, right? And you mentioned it before. So today, now you're working in a new band, Atomic Kings. It's your band. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, Atomic Kings. Um, it came comes out of the ashes of a band called Kings of Dust, yeah. which uh, is a band that I had going um, with different musicians even when I was in Red Dragon Cartel. Okay. So when Jake asked me to be in Red Dragon Cartel, I told the guys, look, I'm gonna go do this, A, because I want to, and B, it'll be good publicity if we ever, if this thing ever turns into anything, because yeah. we hadn't recorded anything at that point in Kings of Dust. And uh, not realizing the power of the internet, uh, all the people that now were on board with this Jake and Greg back together again thing. Mm -hmm. I had no clue that people would care at all. Never mind <laughs> the level that right. of uh, people, uh, the, the interest that people had, right? Yeah, I mean, it was like, well, I had no idea. Yeah. So that kind of carried over into Kings of Dust, which was cool. And uh, when, when I got done with my cancer treatment and all that, we started rehearsing it, finished writing songs for it, 
made a record. Record came out on March 13th of 2020. Guess what else was announced on March 13th, 2020? Boy, I'm trying to, oh, the pandemic, hello. <laughs> right. we, had, we had that going for us. We had that kind of good time. Oh. That record came out, All we had a whole bunch of touring dates, all, all gone. Right. And then in the interim, we changed singers. And what happened was uh, after we changed singers this last March, uh, we, we uh, parted company with our singer. Things weren't going the way we wanted it. And uh, we got a new singer and then we realized, wow, the music still sounds the same, but this, the vocal thing, it has a whole new dimension to it that's different. And so the uh, guitar player, Ryan uh, McKay, who works with me, I, I have a store that I run, Bizarre Guitar and Drum in Phoenix. Ryan works there with me in the store. So he has the complete misfortune of having to work with me in the store <laughs> and be in a band with me. So he gets to go straight to heaven. You know? <laughs> but uh, we were talking about, you know, maybe we should change the name. And so we had, uh, I had a bunch of names that I, I kind of catalog names. And we came up with a name that we liked that had the word atomic in it. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, that night I called them and I said, let's not use this name. Let's use the name Atomic Kings. Okay. And I already liked it. Uh, so it's me on bass, Ryan McKay on guitar, Jimmy Taft is a drummer. And our new singer is Ken Ronk. Very soulful, very kind of Paul Rogers. Well, he plays in a free tribute band, uh, okay. Bad Company That's tribute yep. band. He plays in the Zeppelin tribute band. Oh, wow. Okay. So he kind of has a little bit of that. I don't want to put this... Uh, weight on his shoulders, but he has a little Ray vibe to him, okay. which I obviously like. Sure. So uh, we decided to change the name because it is a whole new band. Uh, all the songs will be written by the four of us as opposed to on the Kings of Dust record. It's written by a number of, I'm on every song, but we have different guitar players, different drummers. Right. And so um, we decided since it is really kind of a new thing with just us four, let's change the name. So sure. we are now Atomic Kings. Awesome. And when do you think you'll have some new music to share with people? Uh, we have a, we're playing our first date. Kings of Dust never played a date. Atomic Kings is playing in El Paso, Texas. Mm -hmm. with a great band headlining called DC4, which is uh, uh, Jeff Duncan from Armored Saints band. And Rowan yep. Robertson is also in that band. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're playing with them. And then we have a few more shows. We have about a dozen songs written for the next record. We plan to record the end of the summer. Uh, we're looking for a late fall release, Christmas time, nice. and we're playing a festival here in Phoenix uh, on uh, the be beginning of November with about 12 or 13 other bands. Okay. And uh, going to try to do a dozen or so shows this summer if we can make it work and put out a new record. Uh, the new material is great. It sounds like it was written by the same people because it is. It is. <laughs> um, but but a new but a, a different approach vocally uh, and lyrically. And uh, while we like what we did before, we really like where this band is headed. The material is very seventies as well. Uh, I still like the seventies because I'm close to being seventy. Oh, oh wow! <laughs> okay. God bless it. <laughs> it's so, good for you. <laughs> so. Um, we're happy with it. Uh, they're great players. Um, I have the same camaraderie with Ryan McKay that I kind of have with Jake as far as musically and as a friend. Jimmy's a great drummer. As a matter of fact, if Jake and I had done another band in L.A. after Badlands ended, Jimmy was going to be the first guy that I was going to bring in and introduce okay. him to Jake. Great drummer, great sense of humor. And Ken is kind of like... Uh, we only had, when we changed singers, we had one guy in mind. Okay. And if he hadn't have done it, we would have found somebody. Mm -hmm. But Ken was the guy, I worked with him in a little uh, bad company free project thing okay. that we were trying to do. And uh, I said, hey, you want to do this? And he said, yeah, I think I might. And he came down and heard the material. He's like, oh man, this is right up my alley. I mean, this has got that 70s vibe all over it. Sure. And I said, as a matter of fact, every rehearsal, I write a new riff. I come in with the riff and he'll come in and he'll go, and we'll be jamming and he'll go, what is this? This is a new song. This needs to be a new song. It's a great song. <laughs> That's great. Something, something we're messing around right, with. Right, right. So he's really into it. Uh, great singer, great performer. Um, 
if you're near El Paso, Texas on the 12th of June, come and see us, anybody out there. But uh, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Uh, the the, the uh, phrase that we use quite a bit is upward and onward. So awesome. we're, we're moving upward and onward. Uh, Atomic Kings, uh, the next record is going to be great and uh, hope everyone likes it. And obviously you'll be get a chance to hear it when we get there. That's awesome. We look forward to it, no doubt. And one of the things I love hearing you talk about it is like you said, you're approaching 70 and the excitement and enthusiasm coming from you is still genuine as if you were that 17 year old kid again. You know, so to me, I think that's really cool. I appreciate it. You know, I, I I'll be 68 in August mm -hmm. nice. and um, I still, other than when I look in the mirror and go, Duh! <laughs> um, I still feel like the same person. So I'm, I'm, I still do all the stuff that I I'm, I'm really active and I play adult league baseball with a bunch of other grown-ups right. and I'm still doing all the same stuff I've always done and that's just the way I'm going to do it so if I was involved in a band and I didn't have the enthusiasm enthusiasm and the feeling of you know kind of joy when I get together with them mm -hmm. I wouldn't even do it because you know I've kind of done everything I need to do to be happy sure. you know I my resume is my resume my legacy whatever it is is what it is mm -hmm. and so the fact that I can get together with these three other guys and we can have a really good time and laugh and tell jokes and write material that we really like that people seem to like as well kind of resonates with me uh, and with all of us. So we, we really having a good time. And, and when it stops being a good time, I can surely attest there's no money in it. <laughs> so when it stops being a good time, I would have no problem walking away right. from it. And I've done what I want to do. Right now, it's a great time, and I can't see that ending at any time, per, to be perfectly honest. This is, the, this is the right band for me in the right time. Having said that, Jake, you can call me anytime you want. <laughs> well, maybe you could call Jake and get him to do a guest solo on the album. We've talked about that. Okay. We've talked about that. Uh, yeah, so um, who knows what will happen in the, in the future. I, I would have no problem with that. But uh, awesome. I'm happy with the band, and... Uh, I'm happy with the direction we're heading in and uh, uh, upward and onward. That's awesome. One last question for you that I'm thinking about as we're sitting here chatting, right? So you started off this conversation and you mentioned your love of sports as a kid. You obviously have all the pictures in the background, you coached with your kids, all of that stuff. If you could do it all over again, base player in Badlands, et cetera, or a major league baseball player, which one? Oh, man, that's tough. <laughs> I... <clears throat> Jeez. I mean, if I had the skill to be a major league baseball <laughs> player, I don't think I had that skill set. Okay. <laughs> I probably, okay, I can answer this question. Hang on, let me get a drink here. Yeah. The residual of 41 doses of radiation in your throat. There you go. Always thirsty. Mm -hmm. I, my baseball career would have probably ended in the early 80s. So then I could have still moved to LA and. <laughs> And eventually join Badlands. And there you, then go. <laughs> you could have done the best of both worlds. Well, I, I, I managed to kind of, you see how I navigated that? I do. Those, that, that was good. Those, those barriers and uh, troubled waters, I navigated it perfectly to, I would do both. Why settle for one if you could do both, right? If you have the skills for exactly. both. Exactly. Bo Jackson exactly. played multiple sports. Why not do sports and right. music, right? Well, you know how many, how many baseball players I know that are, want to be or and not even want to be that are actually good guitar players sure. good bass players good sure. musicians sure oh, I mean, Ber so bernie williams was a great guitarist well there's yeah uh, there's uh a lot of guys that i've met mm -hmm. over the course of my baseball thing they all play guitar and mm -hmm. they all uh, not all of them but the ones that are familiar with me would always be like they'd want to talk about guitar stuff mm -hmm. and my music stuff and i'd want to talk about baseball so we'd spend <laughs> half the time doing one half the time doing the other interesting story i was walking down the street in new york city uh like 48th street okay and this this dude comes up to me this hawaiian looking dude and he says uh hey man aren't you greg chase on from badlands and i said yeah you know at the time it was during badlands sure. and so that wasn't that uncommon and he said yeah hey my name's sid fernandez Oh, wow. <laughs> Sid Fernandez, who pitches for the Mets? He said, yeah. Mm -hmm. He goes, I'm a guitar player. And I said, 
He goes, I'm heading up here to ESP Guitars right now. And I said, so am I. So <laughs> oddly enough, there's a lot of musicians. Sure. Um, Mark Trumbo, I mm -hmm. uh, end up talking to him because he's, he was making a record. At one point I was going to play, he's going to record it here. I was going to play on some of it. Okay. So there are a number of musicians, our baseball players that, you know, when you're stuck in your hotel room and you can't really go do anything, a lot of them have guitars. So true. And you know, whether it's movie stars, sports, everybody yeah. wants to be a musician, right? That's what you I know, it's funny. Them. They're all, they want to be musicians. Mm -hmm. And I would, you know, on the Badlands tour, I don't, you know, like I said, I don't have any drinking or drugs or whatever, those mm -hmm. kind of vices. So I'd bring my glove with me and I'd bring a really hard rubber handball. Okay. And I'd bounce off the wall of the arena and catch it. Oh, nice. And so like when we were with Great White and Tesla, and they'd all, they'd be watching me. Mm -hmm. I could sit out there and do that for a couple hours, just throw the ball and then get different angles and run it down. And they sure. just watch me. They, they thought I was nuts. But that's just my baseball background. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. And I assume the is it Arizona Diamondbacks your team? They were till they traded my favorite player to the Cardinals. Now my favorite team's the St. Louis Cardinals because <laughs> they have, they have Paul Goldschmidt. Yep. <laughs> so Paul Goldschmidt's my favorite player. I actually met him when I was in Red Dragon Cartel. Oh wow. We were flying. I was flying to New Jersey to start the second part of the Red Dragon Cartel tour, and it was like five in the morning. We're waiting to board a plane in a room and I saw Paul Goldschmidt standing there. No one was talking to him. And I walked up to him and I said, are you Paul Goldschmidt? He said, yeah. And uh, he's my son's favorite player at the time. My son was younger. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, can I take a picture of you? He said, well, why don't you just do a selfie with me? And I said, I don't know how to do it. So he <laughs> took a selfie with me and him and I sent it to my kids and I said, Look at my new best, me and my new best friend. <laughs> my kid's going, is that Goldie? <laughs> yeah. So we ended up talking on the plane and then uh, where we went to the uh, Newark, to the airport, baggage is like a 45 minutes to an hour away. Mm -hmm. So we were sitting there waiting for our bags and I sat down with him. I said, care if I sit here? He said, no. So we sat and talked. We know some of the same people. Right. <clears throat> I, I knew some other guys on the Diamondbacks at the time. <clears throat> So we ended up talking for quite a while, super nice guy, uh, down to earth, just like a regular guy. Hmm. And uh, he said he was going to North Carolina. He was a man, if I, if I had a day off, I'd come in, we were going to play at Webster Hall. Okay. Because I didn't see you play it at that gig tonight. Oh. And I have never talked to him since, mm -hmm. but, uh, and then they traded him, damn Diamondbacks. <laughs> and now I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan. There you go. <laughs> well, that'll teach the Diamondbacks to trade your favorite player. That's right. Uh, dive back suck anyway. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Anything else, Greg, that you wanted to bring up or mention for your fans before we wrap this up? No, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. And uh, I know I'm a little long-winded and everything. No, but, uh, it was great hearing your stories. I absolutely love it. Um, Atomic Kings. Is, there, it out is there a website for Atomic Kings? There's a Facebook page uh -huh. uh, called Atomic Kings. And... Uh, um, you can, if anyone wants to find me on Facebook, send me a friend request, whatever, I'll hook you up to that page. We're still kind of at the transitional phase. Sure. We're going to be, we'll have an actual website at some point. Um, we're still working on that right now, but you, there is an Atomic Kings. I think it's, there's two Atomic Kings. One's a furniture store or something. <laughs> okay. So, so, so you can't confuse the two. <laughs> we're not the furniture store. We're the band, Atomic yeah. Kings, the band. There you go. Well, no, it's been great. I appreciate it. No, thank you, Greg. I appreciate it. continued health, please. It's I'm so happy to hear it's six years cancer free. So continued health, uh, continued health to you and your family. And um, we'll look for the CD hopefully later this year. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, that we're planning before Christmas. So that'll be awesome. We'll look for it. Thank you so much for your time today, Greg. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. All right, take it easy. All righty, there you have it. I'd like to thank Greg for spending nearly 80 minutes with me talking all about his incredible career working with Badlands, Ozzy, working with Rat really briefly, and so much more. I really loved hearing all your stories. Thanks a lot, Greg. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. If you're listening to one of my podcasts, subscribe over there as well. Also, head on over to Facebook and follow my page, 
the rock experience with Mike Brunt, where each and every day we talk about all the rock and roll music that you love. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you all next time.